uh, especially I know that this week can be a bit of a busy week, so we do appreciate uh, your participation here tonight in our session, MIA, Managing Information and Attention with Peter Skillen and Brenda Sherry. Um, I'm going to uh, do a quick uh, poll here to see how many of you are familiar with the Blackboard interface. Underneath your name, you're going to see four little icons, and the very right-hand one is a check mark, and you can give me a green check mark if you are familiar with this interface or you can give me a red X if you're not. If you're confused, you can let me know in the chat. Okay, so most of us are comfortable and familiar with it, so we will do a quick walkthrough for uh, Chantel and Kelly. I didn't see any indicator there for you, so we'll assume that maybe you might need a little review. Here we are with a little snapshot of the interface, and um, up here at the top, I'm just going to grab my pointer, the pointer that doesn't want to be grabbed, here we go. Um, and so point number one, if you have a big audio video box that's got a big black space there, you can click on that little black triangle and minimize that. Uh, the all important talk button is there to turn on your mic and when you're finished speaking we do ask that you turn it right back off again. Uh, we will only have one microphone activated tonight. Uh, if you um, want to uh, share uh, some feedback throughout the session, right in the participants window underneath your name, we've got four different icons that give us options. The first one, uh, smiley face, you'll click on that and you'll see a whole bunch of options that uh, you can give us a thumbs up, you can let us know if you want to go faster or slower, or if you're confused and need to uh, clarify something, you can let us know there. The second icon over is your step away icon, and if you need to uh, leave the session and uh, like just leave your computer and go attend to something else, you can let us know there and we uh, won't expect your participation. And when you come back, you just click it again and we'll know you're, you're ready to jump right in. The third icon there is the hand, that's the raised hand uh, button, and so if you do want to um, speak, because we will only have one mic on, you can use that button to let uh, Peter and Brenda know that you would like to share something, and they'll make sure you get that opportunity. And then, of course, we've got the, uh, the little checkmark polling option there as well that might be used throughout the session. Uh, it looks like most of you are already uh, quite familiar with the uh, the chat window there. I'm just going to put my hand back down. Um, and you are certainly welcome to communicate through there as much or as little as you'd like. We certainly prefer to see you participate uh, lots and lots. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that uh, the Blackboard interface, you can unpin these windows by, by clicking on the um, the, the kind of the header of any of those boxes and uh, drag them and move them around and you can grab the edges of them and resize them just like you would any other window on your computer screen and that sometimes allows you to expand the chat so you can see a little bit more of what's going on especially once people start chatting uh, some of those comments can fly by pretty fast so the bigger you can make that window um, the better. Now I'm going to do just a quick little exercise here for you. Um, in the whiteboard screen, you'll see a little vertical tool strip there at the left-hand side of the whiteboard. And the second icon from the top, as indicated by my yellow arrow there, um, is a pointer icon. So if you click on that, you may need to click on the little black triangle in the corner. You'll see a little strip of options come up. And I'd like you to grab one of those icons, and you can drop it on the map of Ontario to show us where you're joining uh, tonight's session from. Fantastic. Look at how fast you guys uh, catch on to these things. Okay, now the second thing I'm going to ask you to do, uh, a couple of items down on that tool strip is our text icon. And uh, if you see it with the capital letter A with the little lines beside it, I would like you to click on the little triangle in the corner and switch to the just plain old capital A icon. Uh, that is our text typing icon and just a little easier to use than the text box version. And then you can click wherever you are on that screen and type in the name of the town that you're in right now. Great job, guys. Guelph, Arviat. Now, someone's cut off over there on the right in North. 
Lancaster. Oh, someone's in Gatineau. Fantastic. We are all over the place tonight. And uh, the last thing I'm going to ask you to do, if you can just quickly type in the chat where you heard about the OTF Connect session. Uh, that helps us keep track of uh, what modes of communication are working best for, uh, for sharing these sessions with our, our colleagues. So thank you again for uh, joining us tonight. I will say um, another thank you on behalf of Sirius Skurhan, who is the uh, facilitator and administrator of the OTF Connects program. And uh, she couldn't be with us tonight. And so so she sends her sincere thanks for giving up some of your own uh, time to join in tonight and expand your learning and, uh, and go back into your classrooms and uh, give your students more opportunities. So thank you very, very much. And over to you, Peter and Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Skillen. And I'm, what I'm going to do is just introduce myself a little bit. And, and Brenda's going to introduce herself, uh, let you know what we're up to in this wonderful world. And um, then we'll have you folks do the same. So I, um, I'm, I was trained as an elementary teacher um, and taught elementary school for uh, the first part of my career, and then worked as a computers and education consultant, um, like coordinator kind of guy with North York School District for uh, the second half, I guess, of my career with the public school system. Uh, then I went off to uh, design a little piece of educational software after, after I retired. And then when that was done, the YMCA of Greater Toronto actually started a secondary school and asked uh, me and a couple of other people to, to sort of make it happen. So I uh, worked at that for um, well, about seven years. And then now I've gone 80% of my time with the Y into a different role. Uh, it's helping them with their professional learning strategy. Um, and then I do some work for Ontario Teachers Federation. I do some work for the Powerful Learning Practice, plpnetwork.com, um, and volunteer with Brenda on the Educational Computing Organization of Ontario. So. Uh, and have always just been really fascinated with uh, the power of uh, kids um, with, um, well, actually trying to leverage leverage kids' use of, of technology to really think deeply. I mean, that's really what I'm interested in, so that's why I, I continue to work into my old age. Brenda. Hi, everybody. I'm Brenda Sherry, and I'm an itinerant technology coach with Upper Grand District School Board, um, which is the Guelph area and Orangeville and Aberfoyle and up to Mount Forest. It's a pretty big uh, area. Um, I was a classroom teacher for 20 years, and I still think of myself as a classroom teacher first. And I'm on a leave from that position to do um, this tech coaching job. So um, I was a primary teacher and, and junior in special ed at that time. Now I'm helping uh, K to 12, but it's mostly about grades 2 to 10, I'd say. So any teachers who would like to um, integrate more technology in their classroom can email me and we get together and we plan um, together, hopefully. Um, or sometimes I'm showing them software or I'm introducing software to their students, that kind of thing. Also, um, part of my job is around assistive technology. So I help those students who, and teachers who have um, kids with the ministry licensed, um, ministry given technology, I guess, both hardware and software. Those students who are LD usually and uh, need a little help with that in their classroom. So it's a pretty very varied kind of job, lots of fun. Um, I also, as Peter said, am working with the ECHO to provide a conference that's happening in October for teachers around technology. I love doing that. And um, I'm also a connected coach and a community leader for Powerful Learning Practice, which is online PD for teachers, both in teams and independently. So that's kind of, that's really fun. And um, I teach an AQ around um, integrating technology into, Q, into classrooms for uh, Laurier. So that's what I'm up to lately. Peter? Not work. Oh, we'll get into that, won't we, tonight? Yes, that's sort of the topic. Okay, so now you know a little bit about me and a little bit about Brenda. Guess what? We don't know much about you folks, so I think it's really important uh, that we find a bit out. So, 
what we'd like you to do is take the opportunity to type into that chat window. We know where you live, well we don't know exactly who lives where, but you can tell us where you are and maybe what your job is and um, maybe why you might be interested in what you might be interested in learning tonight. That'd be really good. So just grab the or just click in that chat window. We'll see your icons light up as you start typing there. And um, honestly, this is going to be a, a night of conversation, we hope. So we really do encourage you to um, put your hand up and grab the mic, interrupt. Um, and when we ask for responses, please don't be shy. I, I know for some, for at the beginning, I was really nervous doing this and it was really hard to speak to my computer and not really get the feedback we're used to getting. Uh, it's a little disconcerting, but we'd love you to give it a shot. Live on the age. Okay, high school English and media studies. Yeah, that's what I did too, John, the last uh, few years. I was new to secondary school, but got into the media, media arts, actually, uh, courses, which was awesome. And Chantal, you're in the education program. Waterloo Catholic. Uh, John, okay. Grade seven, all subjects. Occasional teacher in Durham. B. Ed. Student from Nipissing. Very cool. And Kelly is uh, finishing her B. Ed. Nipissing. Okay, awesome. All right. So welcome uh, to this evening. We decided to do this session. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, and one of the things that sparked my interest was a question that was put to me. And the question goes like this. How is the internet changing the way you think? And it was interesting the way the question, and I'm going to ask you to think about this. I'm going to ask you to start you know, typing responses into the chat room. Uh, into the chat area just to get your take on it. Because the way the question was put was interesting. It, it wasn't how is the internet changing the way we think. It was really super directed and it really forced me to think about a lot of things. And I'll, I'll tell you some experiences after. Um, well, actually, you know what? If you folks just start typing your responses there, uh, you can probably multitask. <laughs> which we'll talk about afterwards. So I'll also tell you like why I got started with this. When I was working in the high school, and you've heard kids say this, oh, sir, I'm just, or they don't come to sir. Hey, Peter, don't worry, man, I'm just multi, I'm not multitasking, I'm on task, I can do it, I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. And so I started really getting interested in that whole issue of, um, you know, how many things can a person do at one time. So it, it sort of got driven initially for me from a student perspective. Um, and then I started reflecting on my own life, my own behaviors, my own responses to things. So that was, that was fascinating for me. So Brenda, how about you? What, are you um, what have you found? Why are you interested in this particular topic? Um, I'm interested in this topic because um, I do love um, I think that the internet has given us incredible benefits over the last few years. Um, I don't know why because it's been around a while, but particularly in the last four years for me, I guess, it's, it's really changed how I do business, I think, the way that I can connect with people. Uh, but I'm interested in this topic because I think that there are times when that comes at a cost for me. Um, so it does, it has changed the way I, maybe I think and behave. And I, I don't know how much I want to say at the moment, but um, I think it'll come out in our conversations and that kind of thing. But that's what fascinates me is kind of, as you would say always, Peter, zooming out and watching ourselves through this period of time that is so new. Um, I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, it's exciting and um you know, I just, I just really like thinking about it more deeply. Thank you. So I'm just looking through what people have said here. And um, so the question, how is the internet changing the way you think? 
And I see responses related to Google, so it's a great way to find information. Um, so I'm seeing that. Um, seeing John say that information is everywhere, but students and teachers don't know how to critically use it, and I think we'd agree with that. And Jackie's already uh, continuing to multitask because we're not occupying her whole brain, which is kind of the normal thing, and that's, that's fine. That's the way to go. Uh, students don't need to retain information. Oh, they can Google it. Now, are you pushing my buttons, Kelly? Because, um, oh boy, what do I do with that, Brenda, now? Should I, should I, let me just, they don't need to retain information. They can Google it. Information is always at their fingertips. Hmm. What do we do with that? Kelly, do you want to give some uh, voice to that? Oh, you know what? You, do you have a mic, Kelly? Yeah, I do have a mic. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that, for the most part, I've found that students, like, they don't feel that they have a need to memorize information anymore because they just feel that, um, like, they can just, mem they don't have to memorize things. They can just Google it. There's no point in, having to retain all these facts anymore. And how do you feel about that uh, piece of information that they're giving to you? Because I'm not disagreeing with you, and, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, well, personally, as, as like a, a future educator, I guess that's a little concerning because um, it's definitely going to change the way that we're going to have to teach, but at the same point, if that is some, like that is just going to be something that we're going to have to think about in our future. So when people say they don't have to memorize things, they can just Google it. What do, what do you think they mean by memorize? Anybody can grab the mic on this. We hear this a lot, right? We see it everywhere. In fact, uh, what's his name? Maybe the type's name in the chat, Brenda. Um, he said he wrote in his book, "Kids don't need to." Don Tapscott. Kids don't need to go memorize anything. They can just Google it. Now, I understand the intention behind that, because a lot of school, particularly in the U.S., is really focused on fact memorization. But. Um, I'm wondering if, in fact, they have to have a rich base of knowledge or not. Do you want to grab the mic and speak to that a little bit? Sorry, I cut my mic off there. Louise, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Um, I'm a big believer in... Um, in all the different neuroscience aspects of learning. And uh, uh, I think that if we look at our evolutionary history of how the brain evolves, if we overlook certain aspects of learning, which might include memorization or training or those kinds of things, then we may be missing an opportunity to wire some of those circuits that will make future learning uh, a little more efficient. And that's only you know one side of it. I don't think that we can ever let go of um, of any way to learn. Sometimes we do need to memorize things. Sometimes we do need to just practice things. And other times, uh, you know, the vast majority of the time, the more you can interconnect the things you're learning with more, uh, you know, active involvement and, and, and knowledge building, uh, the more of those connections are being made and the less the emphasis is on, on one mode of, of learning than another. So I don't think we should throw any aspects out of it, but in terms of how this affects uh, how we think through the the internet, I think that it would be uh, complacent of us to think that we we don't need to encourage students to to build that that knowledge base that allows them to make some of those fact connections that leads to other kinds of connections. You know, it is a lot more than just uh, you know bits and bytes of information, but how we use it and apply it and interact with it. So. So Louise has taken sort of a brain, uh, brain science perspective on it, which I can appreciate and uh, understand as well. And Jackie, so now we're, now we're breaking it down a little bit. Now we're unpacking maybe the intention here. So 
it's not that kids don't have to know stuff, it's that they don't have to wrote, memorize dumb stuff. You're, it's being suggested, I think you're saying that kids actually do need to know stuff and have a knowledge base uh, through making connections and building schema and so forth, as uh, to use a Piagetian kind of framework for it, uh, through engage, through a, you know a, a passionate engagement with project-based learning kinds of initiatives over the road. So, so I understand the intent of the statement. Kids don't have to memorize stuff; they can just Google it. But it's a dangerous statement if it's not, uh, I think, encapsulated in this larger discussion. So I encourage you when your colleagues, when you hear that from your colleagues, just to help them unpack it a bit so that they don't think that kids actually don't have to know anything. Because that's the inference from it and, uh, and you know, that, that's a concern for me. So, um, and rote memorization clearly does not necessarily mean that they know the information. This is very true. So, cool. Um, any other things that uh, you'd like to say about how the internet is changing the way you think? Because there's lots of great uh, research that um, that is coming out in terms of attention issues and so forth. Anything related to attention that any of you might want to add to the conversation? Either just grab the mic or type it in the chat, please. Alrighty, I'm going to suggest that we just move on because some of this stuff will evolve as um, as we go ahead. Um, I can also see that we're not done with that topic about uh, you, you can take one statement like um, kids don't have to memorize anything; they can just Google it. You can spend a whole night on that one. In fact, we have before. Uh, we've done a session on that actually, uh, face to face. So it's been kind of an interesting conversation. So I'm just going to move on here, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, to Brenda at this point for her to uh, address this question or point. Okay, so we wanted to, um, in order to get a little conversation going, we wanted to have you use the value line here online. Usually we do this in, with tape on the floor in our classrooms or signs posted, but we can also do it online. Um, and I think we may have covered this a little bit actually in that first discussion, but where would you put yourself? And what you can do is just go to the little uh, the second button down, I think, would be would do it. Just pick one of those little icons similar to what we did on the map and put yourself somewhere on the line between strongly disagree and strongly agree. Where would you put yourself for the ability to instantly access information is wonderful. How do we feel about that? Let's give you a minute to do that. All right, so we're all here. We're learning online tonight, so it's not surprising that we have a positive uh, feeling about um, life on the internet. Um, those of you who, so somebody's right in the middle with this one, and somebody are, some folks are a little bit closer to the, the middle. Um, and I think this might be related to the kinds of things that uh, Jackie was pointing out, that that you know, kids need to need help with knowing how to find the information, et cetera. Sometimes I feel like I need help too. Um, so grab the mic, will you, and weigh in on where you put yourself and tell us why you did that. And I'm just going to turn my mic off and have someone else grab the mic. Um, I find that it is good, but it's also not necessarily great. Um, I had a class of uh, five sixes who they decided to go and look about um, early civilizations and then solely used Wikipedia. And Wikipedia is not a valid source, so we had to sit there and kind of look at what proper research tools are required in order to actually be able to use them as a source. Nice. So it's not something they're doing uh, independently yet at that grade level, and I would argue even even up higher. Um, and so tell me, were um, did were you okay with them using Wikipedia as a as a beginning um, for what they were searching for, and 
And did they in fact find that it was unreliable information or was it pretty reliable but uh, but sort of got them on to other, other sources? Well, Wikipedia in and of itself is not a reliable source and for the most part it is mostly accurate information but one of my kids came back and told me that it was Spartac the Spartans who started the Olympics, which is just ridiculous because it's clearly Greece who did that. And so sometimes information is misleading and they kind of go off on a different tangent and then they get mixed results. But I found most frustrating was that they didn't really look at any other research. They didn't care about other websites. It was all about Wikipedia because Wikipedia is the first thing that comes up on a search engine, no matter which engine you use, be it Google, Dogpile, or Yahoo. Good point. So there's all, all that unpacking we need to do around filtering information and critical thinking on the web and all of that kind of thing that I think, you know, needs to start pretty young these days because uh, uh, probably students are much more, um, you know, um, open to hearing it perhaps as they start looking for information and then maybe once they've, you know, found the easy way <laughs> to do things um, in the junior, in the junior grades. Any other comments about what uh, your feelings are about the ability to access information? John made a good point up above. Um, he says, uh, um, there's a fast food approach to information that's instantly accessible is hurting students because they don't know how to ruminate. Uh, John, do you want to give some words to that? Uh, just expand on that a little bit? Maybe you don't have a mic. Okay, so, so um, Brenda and myself and lots of others have done lots of uh, reading and thinking about this as well because it is a, it is a huge concern. Um, um, so when you, we get to the resources page, you'll see a few of the things we've written and some folks that have written other stuff, Linda Stone, uh, Sherry Turco, um, to name a couple. So um, it's a very interesting point. I think there's a lot we can do as teachers too to uh, to really help with that. I know that um, one of the one of the folks that does a lot of work in this area is Alan November and he talks about literacy skills. So if you Googled him, he actually has a lot of resources online that help teachers you know, go through some pretty interesting activities like analyzing a website and, um, uh, you know, there are bogus websites out there that you can find with your students and have them pick them apart and really think about uh, what's being said. I, I know the one, uh, the one that I've used with kids is the dehydrated water one. And honestly, this, um, this, um, so he's November Learning, John. I'll just put his name in there. Maybe Peter can find a link for us. Um, it's all about dehydrated water, and there's there's almost there's a store set up where you can buy dehydrated water, and it's just incredible how um, authentic the website looks. The Tree Octopus is another one. I can't remember Pacific Tree Octopus, I think it's called. Um, and one of the most startling ones uh, that I've ever used with kids is the. Um, the martinlutherking.org website, which is actually um, a website that is owned by uh, Stormfront, which is a white supremacist organization. And so at first glance, you look at this website thinking that it is a research site about Martin Luther King, and very quickly into it, if you start to click around, um, you find out that it was it's actually a very, um, targeted to young children and it's by the Stormfront organization. And strangely enough, it, it comes up really quickly in a Google search. Um, and I'm wondering, do you guys know which, uh, what makes something come up quickly in a Google search or come to the top in a Google search? Like why does, when you search something, why does something come up top uh, rather than down below? So John's mentioned that uh, often they have uh, people who optimize your Google searching for a company, so they're they're paid to promote you. 
But in fact, uh, in fact, what it is is that if people have linked a lot of times to your to your website, then your site comes up. So cross linking is indeed the most accurate thing there. I mean, I guess they get paid. I can't remember what they're called, web optimizers or something, when they have that job. So yeah, so this means that lots of students for this Martin Luther King website have used it in their research unknowingly. And uh, it's really an interesting one if you have older students and you wanted to, an activity to go through with them about uh, really questioning what you see online. It's terrific. So I'll just turn it over to Peter. So it's really easy to get off topic, even though we're not quite off topic, but that is taking us in a, in a direction that, um, you know, that requires a lot of work on our behalf as educators. Uh, how to assess and evaluate information. So we've pointed you to some resources there. Um, when we designed this topic tonight, it was more about managing information in terms of uh, not analysis of, uh, of validity or uh, reliability or credibility of, of that data, but in fact sort of the overwhelmingness of it. Um, and. Uh, and now we're going to continue on and show you some tools along the way about how, how we can help or how you can help yourself to manage information and uh, manage your uh, distractedness or our distractedness uh, and kids' distractedness in this kind of environment. So um, Brenda, I'm thinking that we should actually probably um, move on past these two slides. Can you give me a happy face if you think that we should do that? Um, just wondering about the time here because I mean I think you know we've we've got the topic up there um, often and I think we'd agree that um, there's a clickability factor if you got the web um, uh, you've got cell phones you've got Twitter you've got like it's going on everything is designed to click in fact I ended up buying an iPad or sorry a Kindle rather than an iPad originally um, even though I really wanted an iPad. But I did not want another device that helps me click off my reading. So that was an issue for me. So that's what I did there. Um, Brenda, you didn't give me a happy face, so I'm wondering what you if you're interested in having these people. Ah, there you go. Okay, maybe I just missed it because I was yakking. So we'll just fly past this this one. And uh, here, this is a, this is another situation. I mean, you guys were here, so I think you were seeing these things happening. Uh, either with your students or with yourselves. Um, we certainly are, and that's why we start to pay attention to this topic. Um, so what we're going to do next is um, have you watch a video. Now the video is copyright, so we can't show it on screen here. So what I'm going to do actually is paste that uh, video into, um, into the chat area. And then you can click on it. It'll open up your br uh, your browser, and you will watch the video. It's a couple of minutes long. And then what we'll do is, when you come back, what I want you to do, because everybody's going to finish at a slightly different time. So if you when you come back, if you can just put the check mark as I've done there, that'll let us know that you've got it. Uh, or that you finish watching it, and then we'll have a little conversation about it. Um, some of you may have seen this, but it might be new for most of you, I hope so. Here we go. So there you go. Just click on that video link and have fun. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, John. Um, so, was the gorilla not obvious? It was really obvious to me this time. I actually did see it the first time as well, but lots of folks did not. Um, so I'm not sure how you people weighed in that and whether you want to, uh, you know, say whether you did or not. Um, give me a check mark if you did not see the gorilla. Yeah, you saw it. Okay. Yeah. You saw it easily, yeah. Okay, so it was it was mixed for you, but point is, um, and if you read uh, Dan 
Wow, hey, Diane, it's amazing. It really is, and it's uh, it's quite normal not to see it. Um, it depends on the intensity of the task and how how much of your attention you are putting into uh, to the task at hand, and how much you can uh, you know take your attention away. Oops, that's supposed to be Daniel, but Daniel Kahneman has written a book called Thinking Fast, Thinking fast and slow. And he talks about attention quite a bit. Uh, he's uh, quite a renowned psychologist. And it, it's a great book. I've got it in both audio and, um, and text. And so he talks about that too, that, uh, this whole business of uh, attention and how much attention we can give uh, to anything. And in, in my uh, work at Boise quite a few years ago now, I wasn't looking particularly at attention. I was looking at the investment of, of mental energy in a task because I wanted, uh, I was working in, in the area of metacognition and trying to get kids to really pay attention uh, to not just doing their task but reinvesting any extra mental energy back into their task. So I mean it goes sort of like this. You've got a certain amount of mental energy. You are working on a task. That task may be super demanding, in which case you have very little extra mental energy left over. It may be less demanding, in which case you have a lot of mental energy left over. Uh, so it's somewhat of a finite amount. And um, that may be debatable, but it seems not to be so debatable um, according to the literature, both Western and Eastern sciences. So um, basically you have a choice with what to do with that mental energy, the extra stuff. You can exert no intentional control over it and just let the telephone, you hear the telephone or you hear footsteps, you hear other voices and so forth, so you carry it away with that little extra bit of mental energy. Or you might, you know, think about a ski trip that's coming up. You're doing your task, you got a little extra mental energy left over and you start thinking about your ski trip that's coming up on the weekend. Or you can reinvest that mental effort back into a task and this is typically what expert learners do. Um, when they're passionate about their task. Uh, hence, PBL, project-based learning, is often a, a, a great supporter of this kind of uh, energy reinvestment. So you're, you're playing your instrument, you're doing it uh, you know, quite well, but you've got you know, a little bit of mental energy left over and you're thinking, okay, now how can I tweak this up? How can I do this differently? Oh, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd done this. You know, well, next time I play this, I'll do it this way. So you're, you're just upping your, your investment of energy or your investment in your expertise and building your expertise for next time. So the point being, you only have a certain amount of mental energy. Um, so if it's super engaged in a task, you may not see that very well. So the whole issue of multitasking is a real, uh, a real challenge. Are you hearing from your kids about multitasking? What kinds of things are your kids saying in school? Just either type a response or grab the mic. So that's a good question, Jackie. Um, what do you think? Or is it a yes no answer? Often we look for yes no answers. We're that kind of, uh, you know, we, we are that kind of animal. So I would encourage us not to look for a dichotomous situation, yay or nay. I'll look for parameters around it. Brenda changed her answer after I said that no, maybe not. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah, I can listen to music too while doing homework. It depends on the music, uh, it depends on the task, it depends on my level of expertise with the task, it depends on the intensity of the task, it depends on the kind of music, what the intent of the music is. Is it Baroque? running at 30 to 40 beats a minute, or is it headbanging Metallica, which, or Pink Floyd, or whatever. These factors all make a difference. You know, so it's a, it, again, I encourage never a dichotomous answer. So that, that, that I think is, is one of our huge challenges. You know, I was having this conversation with some teachers. Uh-oh, here goes my dog. Um, 
teachers at school today because I was in a school that is French immersion and we were talking about student engagement and um, all the different ways that students might be challenged and whether they were paying attention or being challenged or on task. We were looking at different things around what engagement looked like. And one of the, the things we talked about was the additional um, challenge they have as emerge, French immersion educators is the fact that uh, development or cognitively the kids, I guess, don't have a grasp of the language the same way way yet, uh, especially the primaries, and so they can't get to a level of description with their teachers that they might like to because they don't have the language yet and how technology might help there. So we talked about that idea of fatigue and how they do get tired, um, they do get, you know, that cognitive load is, is quick to, to get um, sort of overwhelming for them. So it's, so it's interesting. I, I, I wonder how, you know, to me, I hadn't thought about teaching that. I mean, I've taught ELL learners, but um, that's an added challenge in the whole program that you may have kids who have uh, issues around um, just getting tuckered out, um, trying to think about what they want to say. It's pretty interesting, too. It reminds me of um, when my daughter was learning to drive, and it reminds me of when Everybody's learning to drive. You're spending so much of your first times in the car learning the mechanics because all those routines are not, uh, you know, mechanized or automatized uh, yet. And so they do take up quite a bit of your mental energy so you don't have as much time to focus on the bigger picture, as it were. Um, and then as time goes on, those become relatively... Uh, you know, what Kahneman would call system one thinking, very automatic kinds of thinking. And so your system two, your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain, your, your uh, executive functioning can all, you know, have time to work on, on the bigger picture and problem solving and so forth. Uh, what fascinates me about this, folks, is that we need to have these discussions with kids and we need to do it in a way that doesn't sound like we're uh, like old people lecturing to them about the new technologies being distracting and so forth. Um, uh, I've always worked with kids before technology came along on um, uh, getting them to really think how they think and understand learning and so forth. And as uh, Louise mentioned, the whole area of neuroplasticity gives a lot of kids hope who in many cases have been told things that uh, were, were truths before the, the science of uh, neuroplasticity arose. So the more we, the more kids learn about learning, um, the better off I think they'll be. So it's very cool. So this graphic is, is kind of fascinating. I'm sure you've had a chance to look at it at this point. Um, so what we're going to do now is sort of move into some more uh, practical kinds of things. Um, and after this slide, Brent's going to show what well, we're going to talk about uh, metaphors that we've used with kids, um, and then uh, go into some tools that will be useful for us to help manage our information and their focus our attention better. So managing emails. Um, so there's some things on that, uh, that branch that you can see. Brent and I work for the Powerful Learning Practice. We probably get um, 50 to 60 emails a day um, from that uh, alone based on um, the discussions we follow in that uh, in that community. Um, it was pretty intense for me, and I think Brandon felt the same. So, you know, I hear my phone beep, beep all day long, there'd be messages coming in, and I really felt like the Pavlov's dog, that I needed to reply relatively immediately. And uh, what we did about a month or two ago was set up um, uh, an automatic archiving of the messages so they came into us once, uh, once a day. And then, so you have a string of messages. Uh, you get one message and then it's just a list and then you can just follow through the list. It really is helpful to manage that. Um, and then, I don't know how much time we need to spend on all aspects of this. Uh, Brenda, do you want to point out any particular parts here or should we just move on to some tools? Well, I just think it's, uh, it's a pretty nice acknowledgement of our working world and our home world and how distracting it can be for us. So when we start to get out looking, feeling overwhelmed, uh, I just love looking at it and thinking, yeah, right, oh yeah, this is what I should be doing. 
spend 10, day, 10 minutes each day decluttering. That would really help me handle my email a lot better and those kinds of things. So uh, take it and use it and uh, you'll get it when you get the resources later. But, um, you know, I do agree with you, Peter. I think it's something we need to start talking about with kids. Uh, I've had the conversation one day in the, on the way home with my son who's at university, second year, and he said to me, Mom, you know, I wish they wouldn't let us have our laptops in the lecture sometimes. And I said, oh, what, you know, why is that? I think we lost your mic, Brenda. Oops, sorry, I, I clicked by mistake. Um, I was just saying that I was taught, my son is in university had a conversation with me one day saying, you know, Mom, I wish they wouldn't let me have my laptop in a lecture. Um, and I said, why? Why is that? Don't you need it for note taking and that? And he said, oh yeah, but it's just so easy to get onto Safari and do something else, you know, when I should be uh, listening. And so, you know, we had that conversation that we're all faced with this um, in today's world, that we all have to make those decisions about what we're going to attend to and how well we're going to attend to it. So, um, you know, kids are, I'm sure, feeling that stress as well, possibly. Uh, that brings up the issue of back channeling, which we actually don't have any, any slide on, but I'm, I'm going to address it because it really fits in here. So for those of you who aren't aware of what back channeling is, back channeling is basically what you're seeing going on in the chat right now. Some folks are having a conversation separate to uh, my, quote, delivery of information to you. Um, that's sort of back channeling. And so uh, kids in school, I mean, kids are great with tools for socializing. And if you're having trouble with kids, uh, one of the ways to help them, help teach them about these things is to channel them with a back channel while you're, uh, while they're, okay, what I did, I had a media arts class and uh, they were, I wanted them to understand the difference between like a, a Roger Waters The Wall uh, show versus The Beatles back in the late 60s. Uh, or mid 60s, uh, and so I had them watch the Beatles video, and then I had them watch uh, the Roger Waters and Wall video, and I set up a back channel so the kids could use their their phones or their laptops to type in things. It was basically note taking, but it was it was public note taking for them uh, using these devices that they're so comfortable with and wanted to use anyway for other things. But I focused them and had them look at the various kinds of media that were included in Roger Waters' uh, show, for example. So it was a focused back channel for them. So it wasn't super taking them off task. It was actually bringing them back into the task with the tools rather than being distracted by the tools. It was enhancing it. And yeah, it was today's meet uh, is actually what we've often used. Um, for that, or you can use a Twitter chat, or you, you know, there's lot, whatever tools you're comfortable with. Uh, there's another cool one these days called Lino It. Then maybe you'll type that in there. That could be used as a back channel as well, although it's slightly different in nature. So, um, any any thoughts or questions about back channeling before we just move on to the next uh, next little piece? Yeah, it's, um, we'd like them to learn how to use like just back channels or today's need or uh, line of it or anything like that. Yeah, give it a shot. Like just, just give it a shot. The kids will be thrilled. They think you're so, you know, they just think you're so cool because you're now using the tools, but really what you're doing is teaching them how to use these tools as cognitive partners, not just social tools. I love it. Obviously. Brenda, over to you. Okay, I'll try and keep my button pushed this time. Uh, so one of the things that sort of got me in, into this whole uh, issue, um, and Peter and I actually read this book around the same time. I think it might have even been at the same time. Um, and I think you pointed me to it, uh, Peter, right around a time when I was so distracted from all the time I was spending on the screen reading and on the web that I could hardly get through an article anymore. I was doing so much really quick scanning of information. I think it was partly because of being on the screen, but partly also just having a lot on the go and just knowing where all this content content was. Yeah, um, very much like what John said earlier. And I actually, um, I actually decided very, very consciously to limit my screen time a little bit and pick up a paperback and read some fiction. 
and I was just feeling that urge to get lost in a book, you know, I wasn't doing that in any of my reading, and it was getting to me, so I was a little stressed about it, Peter said, hey, read this book, I'm reading it now, and I'm really enjoying it, it's fantastic, um, I, in my opinion, it's a lot about what the reading process is, um, the evolution of the reading process, so that's very interesting for us as teachers. And then it describes the difference between traditional reading and the kinds of reading that we do online. Um, I'm just going to flip the page and make sure everybody's seeing the next page. So one of the wonderful analogies that Nicholas Carr does, and you should be seeing a nice scuba diving picture there, I don't think that's you, Peter, is it? But anyway, it's somebody scuba diving. Um, it could be Peter. Uh, so anyway, the analogy he, he, um, he talks about, which we thought was just really brilliant, is that sometimes when you're reading, you need to be scuba diving. You need to be taking a breath. You need to be going deeply into something. You need to be looking around and enjoying it and ruminating, as John said earlier, being reflective in the kinds of reading you're doing. And then other times, uh, he uses the analogy of the jet ski. So those are the times when you're scanning and you're surfing and you're gathering quick information, um, and that that's also a valuable way to be when you're on the net. And so we, Peter and I began to use this kind of imagery with the kids, and we think it's really important for them to acknowledge that they do both kinds of things online, but also to really make them more aware of the kind of decision they're going to make about uh, the time that they're going to spend online. So when they're surfing and trying to Google and find some quick information, they might be jet skiing. Other times they're going to make a specific, um, specific conscious effort to scuba dive. And I agree with you, John. I think traditionally students are riding the sea dews. Um, I love when Ian Jukes talks about how we as teachers read in a Z pattern, which is what traditional text is like. It's left and right and left and right and you're scanning across the page and down. Whereas when they use a lot of imagery that they can use with technology now, they see that kids read in an F pattern. They read the margins, the nav bars, navigation bars along the web and the top pieces of information and then they jump around. On, on the page differently than we do. So um, I don't think it's wrong to do either thing. It's just I think we need to be more aware as learners ourselves um, and consumers of all this information online about what we're doing. And I think we have, we have the uh, obligation to start to talk to kids about what it does to their brain. And um, you know, um, we talk to them about the good things for their bodies and dental health and all that at a very, very young age, I think we really need to start to talk about, about their brain. Any comments about that? Yes, John, I did say an F pattern. So what they can do, they can tell by, I can't remember exactly the scientific term for it, but they can do some imagery about where your eyes are going on a screen and they can monitor that now and kids read across the top and down the, so down the left side. So what they see is it's forming kind of like an F pattern, eye tracking yeah, instead of the Z pattern that, that's more of a traditional reader. So it's really quite interesting. The other thing they need to know is, you know, Google is really designed to have them click around and, um, you know, that's a very conscious uh, conscious decision on the part of people who are creating those interfaces for us, so kids maybe need to know that. That's our opinion anyway, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. Would you use that analogy with your kids? Uh, do you see your kids uh, on the wind, on the ski doos as opposed to scuba diving? Great point, Louise. Uh, that there, there is that problem of being overwhelmed by the big body of water. So there's a nice another analogy from his metaphors um, that we could also use with kids. It's terrific. That's nice, John. Yeah. 
So one of the things you can do, um, Brenda made the point about um, the internet being designed uh, to have you click. It clearly is designed to have you click. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of money invested in uh, in getting you to click, uh, which essentially takes you, uh, well, one could say it takes you off task. It certainly takes you away from the page. So one of the other things that we've done is uh, and you know, I started this back in 1986 when HyperCard first arrived on the scene, um, because I, I'm sort of a we are both you know we would describe ourselves as social constructivists, I guess, or constructionists. So we sort of arise out of the logo tradition of having kids program in logo and and in HyperCard. And HyperCard was really the first tool on uh, that came around that allowed you to create a link and click to different pages, much like we do on the web now. So I had kids at that time write in writing and creating in HyperCard, and uh, nowadays kids should be writing in hypertext. Um, I think it's very important uh, for them to learn how to write uh, with links and so forth. And one of the things, therefore, you can bring out during that time is you want to put a link every place you can. Do you want people linking off your page at this point? Do you want people to stay on your page to continue to read to the bottom without linking off for elaboration and getting lost and off, off your topic? So even when I'm writing my own posts now, I don't put in as many links as I used to. Because, you know, let's face it, it's, it's typical novice behavior. Because you have the tool, because you have the hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you start, hit, you start putting links everywhere you can. And what you find out over time is that you're not really serving uh, your intent as an author if you are taking people off somewhere else. So it's really kind of cool to teach kids to write hypertext and then have them uh, somehow brought to that discussion as well. And then they learn how to transfer that. Then you can make the explicit transfer across to how the internet is designed to pull them away to buy something or whatever, right? Kind of cool. Yeah. 